Well, hello again, church. How lovely it is in song and worship and scripture reading. I mean, not just to hear it, but to be moved by it. Really beautiful. Really beautiful. Praise God. Um, I'm going to talk about treasure today. A few weeks ago, we had Manasseh and Titus, Nathaniel and Ezekiel with us. And um, they were digging in the backyard. And they were looking for treasure. That takes me back to my boyhood. Poppy buried some things in the background, and underground and all the rest of it. So um, I suppose I want to introduce the story from a background of our childhood dreams. As a boy, I had a dream of finding treasure. I just, I don't know how this ever came, whether I read a book or something. So what I did, I started a coin collection. So I started collecting coins and I had an old clay jar that I put all my coins in. And there were thruppences and sixpences, that's where I started with. A few florins, then some coins from some of the... Asian ships that came into the port of Burnie, Tasmania. And then I started drawing treasure maps. <laughs> I laugh about it now. I drew treasure maps and put them in my Bible. And one of them was in the back of my Bible of the burial place of Abraham. Because I knew that Abraham was a righteous man, he was a rich man. And I thought, a wonder in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, there might be some treasures there. <gasps> well, anyway, when I turned to tw- age of 25, I went to Israel. And I went and worked for the City of David archaeological excavations right in Jerusalem for four weeks. I was six weeks in Israel. And my goal, well, it wasn't my goal, I was hoping to find some gold coins. Now, let me bring it up on screen. Are there some of the jars of the coins that I've been collecting over many years? I've got a jar here, it's empty, but I've got probably about one, two, probably three or four of these jars full of coins collected over... I suppose I started collecting when I was about six or seven years old. I'm 65 this year, so you can see the best part of six decades of coin collecting. Now this, pati- now, this particular coin here is a Roman coin. And this coin here was minted in the time of Alexander the Great. Now, I would have loved to have been one of the archaeologists to have found that and had my name at the Hebrew University. But unfortunately, instead of finding that, we just found broken, broken pottery. But for an archaeologist... Even though in a museum this is valuable, for an archaeologist, broken pottery is just as valuable. You can see that this has been in fire. Now I have, this is not from Israel, this is actually from Turkey, and this clay jar is made in Turkey as it has been done for four millennia. But when an archaeologist finds this, they can understand where the clay was found from, what the jar was held, how it was baked, and compare it with clay broken pieces across the, the known world, and work out how people traded. Now, for you and I, it's just a piece of rubbish. But um, 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 there's a lot of information held in broken clay. And and so I really enjoyed my time. I didn't care that I didn't find any gold coins. It didn't matter. Let's put them in the jar. But what I did delight is being awoken to when war and conquest and fire happens, for example, in Israel, they've just recently discovered the burning of the, of the Herodian temple, where it was completely burned down and destroyed. And um, they've got the charcoal and the ash there from that time. Pretty amazing. And, um, and so I came back from Israel a changed man. I'd walked the steps of Jesus. I'd been the places that he'd been. And my heart was beginning to be changed in where my treasure was no longer in spending all my weekends building a hot rod. Yes, I I went through that. I spent years in a garage building a hot rod and then playing with motorcycles. I realised that the Lord wants our time, our talent and our treasure for his glory. And I realised that I was, you know, God gives us stewardship. God gives us responsibility. And he wants us to know what's really, really, really important. So I want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, about what's really important. This is Jesus teaching his disciples. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, it could have been one of those gold coins or it could have been a hoard of gold coins. In fact, I know, what do you call those people who store for the end time? They, they preppers, they're called preppers. They have underground bunkers, they have water tanks, they have rice and wheat stored away. 
all these kinds of things. He says, Jesus says, Do not lay up yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust and where thieves break in and steal. Moth and rust and thieves, a beautiful reality that you buy a brand new car, either a thief is going to steal it, you're going to crash it, or it's just going to get old and worn out. But lay up for yourselves, in verse 20, treasures in heaven. There's a contrast here. In Emmaus equipping, we're going to be looking at contrasts in Scripture. There's a contrast with treasures on earth, rich and powerful. Didn't Jesus say how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Where neither moth or rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And you know, when you're talking to somebody, you know where their treasure is because what they talk about. What do you talk about? What do you talk about? You know, actually Jesus spoke a lot about money and he spoke about treasure. In other words, the things that we focus on and the things that we invest in. I hope today the examples that we explore help us to realise, oh, I've got to reorient a little bit more that way. I've got to change something that I'm doing here. In Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. That's what fascinated me. In fact, I made a little video about it many years ago where I buried some treasure and we, we did a little treasure hunt, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now we're not talking about he shouldn't he contact the Antiquity Society and let them know that there was treasure in the field. The idea, the message is that he sells everything that he's got. What's that? His house, his land, his furniture, his, his things. He sells everything and goes and buys that field. And so you read the next verse and it talks about the parable of a pearl of great price. A man finds this great pearl, he's a merchant, and he forsakes everything for that one pearl. Jesus is telling us something very, very powerful. And um, I think the word that treasure means the things that we value most. What do you value most? What do you think about most? What do we put most of our energy towards? What's our dreams and aspirations? Jesus said, often said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Now, I mentioned Abraham earlier. Abraham was very wealthy. That didn't prevent him from being righteous and holy and faithful. But brothers and sisters, wealth can separate us from the transcendent reality of the treasures in heaven. The parable of the sower says that the seed sowed on good ground and listen to what happens. The seed is the word of God in Luke 18 verse 14. Luke 8 14. And Jesus explains the parable. That which fell among the thorns are those who hear but go their way. They are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Do you know why evangelism in the Western world is so hard? Because we've had it so prosperous. What do you need God for? God's just regarded as a crutch of the ancients. Because we have everything. We are pro and so the word of God is choked by the cares of this world, the riches in this world, and the pleasures of life, and the fruit does not mature. Now, why is that? You know why? Is because the wealthy who have lots of gold coins trust in their wealth. It gives them extraordinary influence and power. If you won two million dollars tonight, or somebody gave it to you, you would have a lot of friends. Hello, how are you? Haven't caught up with you for a long time. They're testing your generosity. In other words, it gives you societal status. And yet, brothers and sisters, there's a great equaliser called death, and you can't take it with you. I remember a pastor in Tasmania saying, the only thing that you'll take with you into the kingdom of God is the relationships you form in this age. Someone else receives it. You know, if you go back to Ecclesiastes, and we're not going to look there, Solomon struggles with the idea of injustice, where upon your death, all your possessions goes to a stranger. And he says, this is vanity. It's a grievous evil. It's wrong. You've worked, you've toiled, and you take none of it with you. And I want to turn to Luke chapter 12, because there's another beautiful parable there. And Jesus told them in verse 16, a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. 
So he was doing well. And he thought to himself, now listen to how much he focused on himself. What shall I do, for I have nowhere to share my crops? A lot of emphasis on himself. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store my grain and my goods. Do you see the I and the me and the my woven into his thinking? And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. How many times have you heard that? But God said to him in verse 20, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It focuses me to realise what am I doing with my time? What am I doing with my talent? What am I doing with my treasure, the things that God has given me? You know, that's the crux of the message today. You know, in Matthew, another parable, Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you came to me as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren. You have done it to me. Boy, that's powerful. That is really powerful. Listen to the next conversation. A rich man, young man came to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Well, what a beautiful question. And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he says, I've kept all the commandments. And you think, well, good boy, what a wonderful man. Matthew 19, verse 21, And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor. So all those gold coins that you've got and all the affluence and power, go and give it to the poor people and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And he says, the young man heard this. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. There's nothing wrong with great possessions, but it prevented this young man from taking the next step that Jesus wanted for discipleship. The disciples said to Jesus, we've forsaken all. What's our reward going to be? That young man had wealth, power, status, comfort. He didn't recognise the greatest truth or the treasure standing before him talking to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the life, I'm the truth. He didn't see Jesus and he didn't recognise what heavenly treasures are. You know, it's a sad thing. Now, we don't know the rest of the story. Maybe he repented. Maybe calamity took it all away from him. We don't know. Apostle Paul addresses this issue in a couple of places. I've got the scripture on the screen, but you may want to turn in your Bibles. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. He says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the richness of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. All the richness and the full assurance of God's mystery, which is Christ. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The beautiful thing about King Solomon's response to God saying in provision, Solomon, whatever you want, I'll give to you. And then God says to Solomon, because you didn't ask for riches, or long life. You asked for wisdom to look after the people of God. I will give you wisdom and I'll give you all everything else as well. You know, Paul teaches Timothy, uh, Paul teaches Timothy a similar teaching in 1 Timothy 6 verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. So within the congregation that Timothy was pastoring, under the mentoring under Paul, there were rich people. Remember, Jesus was ministered to by quite a few women, Joanna and Susanna, and they were well-to-do women, and they provided for Jesus and his disciples. There's nothing wrong with wealth, but he says, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of the gold coins that you have stored away in a clay jar. But on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy, there's another contrast the uncertainty of fleshly human material riches and the God who provides us, richly provides us with everything to enjoy. 
And it's very hard in the flesh, in the physical realm, to recognize there are treasures laid up in heaven, a crown of glory. <coughs> Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Now I could, I could play around with this jar and I could store these up. And I've only got two of them. Don't worry, I bought them for, of Timu. So you know that they're not genuine and you think, well, John's been investing all his time in, in genuine gold. These are fake replicas, let me assure you of that. I just have to make the record straight, otherwise you think there's a hypocrite preach, preaching. They're storing themselves in verse 19 for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The Lord Jesus Christ is our path to life, brothers and sisters. He is our greatest treasure in that sense. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. You know, God is the potter, we are the clay. He is moulding and shaping vessels for his glory and honour. What's been deposited into us? Number one, the life of Jesus' blood, atoning us from sin. And number two, the Holy Spirit, the seal of life. And he goes on to say, avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. You can become so sidetracked in pastoral ministry. As an archaeologist, I travelled through the Sinai Peninsula, but I did not go to the wonders of ancient Egypt. But when I was a boy, an Egyptian, I suppose that probably inspired me, and a small Egyptian artefact display came to the town of Burney. It was held in a Gospel Hall church, and my dad and I went and looked at about, a, I don't know, 60 or 70 artefacts from ancient Israel, Egypt. Cuneiform tablets, gold trinkets, things from the past, and I went, wow. Egypt was one of the mightiest, richest empires. They had a lot of gold. You read about the, the gold in Ophir was very good. They had mines, etc. there. And, and unfortunately, I have a Roman coin, I have a Greek coin, but I couldn't find a replica Egyptian coin. Um, but Moses grew up at the height of Egyptian wealth and archaeology tells us of that kind of wealth. If we go to Hebrews chapter 11 beginning in verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, he made a choice rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater, of greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. That is a powerful statement. And you could say, the reproach of Christ? Well, Jesus hadn't been born by then. Well, the God he worshipped, as we read, Jesus said, all those scriptures speak of me. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than all the treasures of Egypt, and he was looking to the reward. Moses saw something transcendent beyond the glitz and the glamour and the status and the power of being adopted Pharaoh's son or the son of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, the boy that was pulled out from the bulrushes in, in the Nile River. Moses saw a reward. You know what Jesus says in the book of Revelation? Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone what he has done speaks to us today as it spoke to, to Moses back then. You know, the greatest gift that you and I have been given is on receipt of baptism. When you and I came out of the waters of baptism and you had hands laid on you and you were given the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit in the womb and full of the Holy Spirit through his life. And you and I have been given the greatest treasure. We are like a jar full of olive oil. Olive oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And oil used to be stored in jars like this. And we are the clay jar. And we are, like the widow in Sidon, the jar of oil that never runs out. For all the hard times, she keeps pouring the oil and filling up neighbours' jars. And for three years, the oil never ran out. God is the plotter, potter. We are the clay. He is doing something marvellous with us. And Jesus says, as recorded in the Luke, 
how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's have a look at this, this idea that you and I are a jar of clay. This is a metaphor, a biblical metaphor. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. For Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That's our message. That's the, the centre point of our message. We don't talk about ourselves. Jesus is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God who said, let light, light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Boy, we could have a whole Bible study about that. Has shone in our hearts to give light, because we were formerly in darkness, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. The Holy Spirit. To show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. It's a very powerful analogy. That you and I formed out of the dust of the ground and God said to Adam, from dust you were taken and this is what this is made out of. And dust you shall return. In fact, Adam means, as I understand it, red clay. Christ in us is the greatest mystery of all by the Holy Spirit. The greatest treasure we can ever have or want or desire. What does it look like? Let's turn to another scripture. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So you get to know somebody. You're dating someone, you're meeting a business acquaintance, you're having a, 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 a meeting with someone, a constructive meeting, a connection. What do they talk about? What's in their heart? Joshua and I were talking before services about loose jokes that are really not necessary in the, in the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus says, by your words you'll be justified and by your words you will be condemned. What's in our heart? So in our day-to-day -day interactions, what we do, what we, in the busyness and distraction of life, what is our treasure? You know, some people have treasure in their in their story. I have a PhD in robotics or neurological science. Or my father and grandfather did this and I'm extra special. Listen to the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul was highly educated. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. I myself have reason of confidence in the flesh also. So Paul says to those who are boasting, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Let me tell you, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, got it right, of the people of Israel, yea, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, you couldn't fault me for law keeping. As to zeal, well, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, the law of God is holy, righteous and pure. And Paul was saying, I kept the law and I was blameless. But he says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So he could have used his past life credentials as badges to sort of say, well, here I am, guys. No. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth, the worthiness, the treasure of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That's what this sermon is about. When you know Jesus as your Lord, as your Saviour, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he says, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The Greek word there is skivola, like chaff. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the pearl of great price. All the things around us are transitory. You know, when I see a gold coin, I get a glint in my eye. 
you know, value-wise, there's about an ounce of gold there, so there's about $4,000 in each hand. But historical-wise, there's $300,000 in my hands. Thank you, Timu. Brothers and sisters, Christ is our treasure. God promises to provide for us everything that we need in this life. Have you ever read some of the Proverbs lately? We read some Proverbs over dinner last night. They're like a sermon per sentence. In Proverbs 30, the author says in verse 8, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Let me be true, God, true to you in every word I say. Give me neither poverty or riches. I think I like to pray for riches, don't you? But no, there's something wiser here. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Who is God? Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Matthew 6.33 is very powerful because Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Your food, your clothing, your shelter, the things that everybody seeks will be yours as well. God will provide and when we know that, we live that. It's very powerful. I want to finish off in Revelation today. The greatest riches is in the worth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah and John heard the angelic hosts singing praise to God. Worthy is the Lamb of the greatest treasure, of the greatest richness. The worthiness, this is what worship is, proclaiming God worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And the angelic host never ceased from singing that. And John heard it and Isaiah heard it. Brothers and sisters, today is a reminder that the, the wealth of Babylon and the wealth of Egypt and the wealth of Greece and the wealth of Rome can beguile us in this Babylonian system. But you've been called out of darkness into the glorious light, into the riches of Jesus Christ. And I trust and pray that we recognise where our worth is. Our worth is not in our pedigree. Our worth is not in our status. Our worth is not in our wealth. Our worth is not in our intellect. Our worth is worth in Christ and Christ alone.